like to look at a car. Yeah. You know, I know they with the restaurant you said will sizzle not the steak. But in the car world, you gotta see what the steak looks like. I'm here in the basement of the Nissan Heritage Collection where they keep all the cool stuff like this 240Z or this first generation GTR. You notice it's right hand drive because they brought it in from Japan and of course it turned out to be one of the hottest performing sports cars of all time. Now if you're a young person you might think well the 240Z that was probably the first one. No, no, there's uh, a lot of stuff that goes back further than that. Let's meet Dave Bishop. Dave, how you doing? You're kind of the caretaker here? I am, Jay. Thank you very much for visiting us. We appreciate it. Yes. I, 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 is this a volunteer deal? Do you work for ne the Nissan? I work for Nissan, yeah. Okay. I'm senior manager of product development for the after sales division, but in my part time, myself and another gentleman, Jeremy Stillwell, we take care of our heritage collection, take them to shows, restore them. Oh, very cool. Very cool. And of course, Nissan goes back further than 1971 when the 240Z was introduced. Oh, absolutely. Back to what, about late 59, 60? Well, in the United States, uh, our first cars came over in 1958, but the, the, the Nissan Motor Corporation was, was formed in the 20s, and the oldest car we have in our collection is in 1937. Now, here's a rumor I always heard, and this is one of those things that goes around. I heard when Nissan came to America, they weren't sure that their product were up to snuff. I guess they took them out on the highways and they didn't hold up particularly well. The ones they sent to America, they branded Datsun until the name uh, was worthy of the brand name Nissan. Is that true? Is that it, true? It's, it's not entirely true. It really, more than anything else, it was the folks at, at Nissan at the time thought it was easier to pronounce for the Western tongue. And then in the, in the mid-1980s, we brought it all together under the Nissan brand name. Okay. But every Datsun that's in this museum, if you open up the hood and you look at the VIN data plate, it says Nissan Motor Corporation, Yokohama, right. Japan. Right. So. Because my first sports car, uh, my first car was a 34 Ford I got when I was 14. When I was 16 or 17, I trade that in to get a Datsun 1600, which mm. I thought was just the greatest sports car at all time. It was the sort of grandfather to that car, the 240Z. Right. That was the first sports car really designed for the American market, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Because yes, it, it sort was. of, it looked kind of like an XKE, Kind of like a Corvette, long hood. little Ferrari Daytona. Yeah, in there. yeah, exactly, right. exactly. And of course, a six-cylinder engine with a five-speed, which people have to remember that was back in the days of MGs and Triumphs. Those were 1,100, 1,200 cc's, you know, early ones. That was a dramatic yeah. uh, move upwards. And it's most direct British competitor would have been an MGB GT at the time. Right. But that's an 1,800 cc cast iron motor. Right. This is a 2.4 liter single overhead cam. So and it's, you it's had air cool. conditioning and roll up windows Ooh. and a few other things. Let's go back and look at some of the early stuff. I think most people know a lot of the modern cars, but is that a Paul Newman car? Yes, it is. Yeah, we have quite a few vintage race cars in the collection. In fact, we'll be taking uh, the IMSA GTP car down to Amelia in uh, the end of okay, this week. Because my friend Adam Carolla, he's a huge Nissan and yeah. Paul Newman fan. Yeah. And he's got a couple of the race cars. He does, he has hey. quite a few. See, that's what I liked about Paul Newman, that he, a big star, and he could have raced Ferrari or Mazda, you know, one of those sort of prestige brands of the day, but he chose Datsun. Right. I think it was Bob Sharp out of Connecticut, Yes, right? Bob Sharp yeah, and, and thought, Connecticut. I yes. thought that was just great. And he, he really gave Datsun and Nissan the name, didn't he? Yes, and he didn't start racing until uh, into his early 40s. Yeah, 44 years yeah. old, I think yeah. he was. Yeah, oh, very cool, very cool. Adam will be very jealous. <laughs> now this makes me smile. This is a 280? 280ZX. 280Z, yes. only because this looks like the Japanese were studying American marketing so with the gold and the black and the gold stripes and the T-top roof, it, it, it looks like an Americanized version of Trans Am. Of sure. Trans -Am. We were definitely dialing in the marketing. The launch campaign for this was very interesting and it yeah. showed a, a very stereotypical 80s actor, almost like the Marlboro Man or something yeah, like the, that. The, the, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that kind of, because exactly. to me, the 240 was the purest yep. example of the car. Yep. And I guess this owes something to Mr. K too, doesn't it? Oh, it wouldn't have been here if it wasn't for Mr. K. This this yellow 260 here was Mr. K's last demo at the company. We should explain who Mr. K was. I was fortunate to have him come to my garage. He was a Japanese gentleman who came to America, and he realized when the 240Z uh, was unveiled in Japan, they were called what the Lilac and the Fair Lady. It was a Fair Lady. The yes. Fair Lady and. 
Mr. K, although those are beautiful names in Japan and flowers, he knew Americans like names with X's and Z's. And I remember yep. hearing him say, we like X's, we like Z's, you know. And, and so he, he made it to 240, uh, the 240Z because it just sounded more sure. exciting. Well, he, he realized very astutely at the time that something called a fair lady just wouldn't be <laughs> yeah, masculine yeah. enough for the sports car market in North America. I just, it must have been fun trying to explain to the you know, the, 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 the conservative leadership in Nissan. You see, in America, why wouldn't they like a fair lady? Why wouldn't they? It just kind of made me laugh. And this seems like sort of the ultimate version of that, just that American machismo kind of deal, you yeah. know? It's very funny, very funny. How long did Mr. K live? He lived to be quite elderly. He lived right? to be 105. That's yeah. He that's just a, just died a couple of years ago. I think he was 100 when he came to my garage, and he was yeah running around. He was he was still him. signing books and, oh, yeah, and on the auto yeah. show tour yeah, into his hundreds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think he did as much for Datsun in the early days as just about anything. Huh? Mm -hmm. Can we see some of the really old stuff? Absolutely. That's what I want. Walk to around the corner. Ah, Datsun 510. Now, I remember these in the day because I worked at a uh, BMW dealership and. They were a little scared of this car, weren't they? Sure, because this was a, a price point entry into the sports sedan market, and it was a threat to a BMW 2002 at the, at the time. Not a threat to the car, but calling to the same sort of customers. Right, right. Independent rear suspension. And yeah. the funny thing is, this car became sort of the Hot Rod 32 Ford of kids in the mid 80s sure. and early 90s because you could buy them fairly cheaply they made great race cars they would blow well here you go the, the early tuner set yeah is this the one that won the championship this is the car this okay. one the trans am national championship in 71 and 72 with john martin behind the wheel Yo, I know John Martin. He's been in my garage. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. He, he's very much involved in supporting the Datsun Nissan name, and we're going to have him at the, the MIDI Challenge in Atlanta next month. He's going to be the Grand Marshal. Oh, very cool. All right, now this is a car that stole my heart when I was a teenager. When I was 14, I had a 34 Ford, and I worked on it. When I was 16, I got my license. I drove it for about a year and a half, two years, and I saw one of these. It was secondhand, so it would have been two years old, probably in 68. Mm -hmm. It was a 1600 yellow with the black interior. I thought it was the greatest bargain and just a wonderful, wonderful car. I actually had roll up windows and a heater that worked and all the right. things that my other right. cars didn't have. And it was pretty bulletproof. Oh, it's just great to see one again. Now this, look, this has got headrests. So this is gonna be a later model, correct? Yeah, this is a 1970. Uh, we have had this car in the collection since the car was built. Nissan never sold it. In fact, as it sits here now, it's got 764 miles on it. Okay, anyway, sure. We can work it out, you okay. know. We can work it out. Get this now, as much as I'd like to relive the experience of driving one of these, I, I, I'd like to try something real early, back in the days when they were trying to prove their metal. you know what I'm okay, saying? Okay, yeah. What do you got? What year is this one? Well, this, this is a 1960 Datsun 1200 sedan. <laughs> now, see, this looks like, with this humpback, it looks like almost a car from from the 40s or mid 50s it's definitely 50s uh british styling and yeah. british engineering bmc was in partnership with uh, nissan at the time oh okay just like we have the renault and mitsubishi alliance today we have right. an alliance with bmc and a lot of engineering and styling carried over from the era and, and pretty straightforward car high roof yeah Nothing sporty at all about no, it. No, in fact, it's got a solid beam front axle. Really? And four-wheel drums. Well, that's, that's yeah. pretty primitive. Three-speed or four-speed? Four-speed, four on the tree. Four on the tree, okay. Yeah. And no radio? No, nothing. Uh, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> actually, it's kind of cool. Yeah. So when this came to America, who was the competition? Was it the Ford Falcon or the Corvair or the Fairlane? Who were they trying to compete against? We would be trying to compete at that point with early VW Beetles and, and the whole slew of European imports that were coming in in the early 60s. And it must have been tough because the 60s were just 15 years away from World War II, really. So there's still a lot of sentiment that... Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. There, was, there, was, there was some you know, resentment and there was also some doubt that the Japanese could build quality cars. Right. And so it was a very much an uphill marketing challenge. And, and did they take American cars to Japan and take them apart and study them to build a car for the American market? Not at that point. No, okay. Was this built for the American market or was this a Japanese car that would have sold in Japan and they sent it here. It was a Japanese car that was built for the world market. It was built in left-hand drive and right-hand oh, drive. Oh, so it was built for the world market. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And this looks like, see, this looks like something that would have been added for the American market. Just a, just a bit of uh, It does polish. look like that, but it's actually original to the car globally. It's a good way to grab the hood and open it. Can we take a look under the hood? Shall I open it? Absolutely. 
Open the door right there. It's usually on the dash right here. There right? you go. I knew you'd know where it was. There you go. That's it, 1200 cc and so roughly. So it's basically, it's almost a copy of a British motor, isn't it? It's a, it is overhead very. Overhead valve, not overhead cam. Yes. No, nothing tricky, just a workhouse. What does this make, about 58 horsepower? It made 48 horsepower. 48 horsepower. That was it is. It's cast iron overhead valve and it is very closely related to BMC's B-series engine, yes. And how many of these did they sell in America that first year? I can't imagine. Uh, when we first came into the country, the first year or two we sold 146 cars and then this one in 1960 we sold about 1300 of them. Now is that mostly on the west coast? California I think was probably yeah. more yeah. understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Kariyama was going around talking to any used car dealer he could find and see if he could set up a, a franchise. Yeah, yeah, wow. So we started with this and we started with the basic pickup truck in 1960 and then things started to roll from there. So you got a single master cylinder that looks like a new piece. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those things we've had to. And is that a, a, a work light or is that just a hood light under there? No, this is a work light. This is something that. Oh, that, that's cool. That um, all vintage Datsuns have. 240Zs have these. They yeah. have little work lights. And, uh, yeah. Cool. That was a pretty cool feature for a basic economy. Well, it was. Can we take it for a ride? Absolutely. Let's do it. There you go, 48, 48 horsepower. horsepower. But the car only weighs what? About, oh, maybe 1,500 pounds. Oh, it's gotta be heavier than that. Maybe 18, something like no. that, but still pretty light. I always love these non-power assisted cars. No power steering, no power no brake. brakes. Everything no. is light and easy to handle. And Things were a lot simpler. Oh yeah, very cool. Well, it's a solid little car anyway. Yeah. Not the fastest thing I've ever no, driven. No, just got a stout heart. You know, my favorite thing are the owner's manuals from the Japanese cars from this period, because they, they don't quite translate. I have one for a Honda. It said, when meeting the giant dog in the road, toot the horn melodiously, as the dog will then bow to let you pass. And I thought, wow, well, imagine a dog actually bowing and you know, yes. to let you pass. I mean, all that kind of great stuff like that. And in the illustration, they show the guy driving, and there's a giant dog in the road that's bigger than the car. And you go, what are they, what, what are they thinking here? Is this some, you know, it, it's just very funny. I noticed many of those illustrations too. They're not, they don't necessarily have the cars and the people to scale. Right. They don't, they, yeah. they, they, to make the car look bigger, they make the people smaller. Right, right, you know? yeah. Whereas if you took a picture of us now driving this car, it's pretty obvious we're filling up the whole cabin. Yeah, that's an old, I think his name was Art Fitzgerald. He did a lot of the drawings for GM in Pontiac back in the 60s. And the Pontiacs would be these enormous things. These people would be these little, little, tiny, little tiny heads, you know, yeah. hilarious. So in 1958, the slightly previous version of this with the 1,000 cc motor we were talking about before, yeah. competed in the um, a mobile gas sponsored um, rally around the entire rim of Australia. Oh, okay. And, uh, was Australia the second biggest market? It was a very early export market for us. Um, because it was right hand drive? Yeah, and it was close. <laughs> I guess it's closer, that's yeah. right, I keep thinking, yeah. Not that far away. Was Tennessee the first plant uh, for Nissan in America? Yes, Smyrna, Tennessee, just yes, outside of Nashville. That was back in the 80s, right? Yeah. yeah. We um, opened that plant up in 1983, and uh, in the collection we have the first vehicle that came out of the plant, the 83 yeah. pickup truck. And now we have a, another assembly plant in Canton, Mississippi, outside Jacksonville. Yeah. And we have an engine plant in uh, Deckard, Tennessee. Well, it's watertight. Yeah. Brakes are okay. Brakes are okay, yeah. Yeah, there was nothing groundbreaking about this. It was just a well-made, solid car. Nothing, Good you know, basic transportation. Yeah, good basic transportation. Well, that's what we cut our teeth on the Nissan, and that's what built the brand over the years. Right, right. You know, the 240Z was the, the halo car, but right. 
For every one of those we sold, we sold thousands of... And the 240T was hugely successful, wasn't it? Yes. There were waiting lists when it first came out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because that was the first Japanese car where they said, hey, we're going to compete with Triumph and Corvette and everybody else. Yeah. And they were quite powerful, 150 horse, which doesn't sound like much, but at the time, MGs and Triumphs were, for the most part, under 100 horsepower. Yeah, that's right. And bulletproof, you could drive them anywhere. Well, you could probably get in this and drive it back to California, all the way back to Burbank. You know, I'll drive it back right now. Well, thank you. That's very nice for you to give it to me. I appreciate that. It might take us a while. Yeah, I don't think we need to tell the corporation about it. I mean, you realize this is pretty much even pre-war technology. Basic transmission, engine in front, you know. Yep, non-synchronized first gear. Yeah. And uh, 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 as I mentioned before, a beam front axle. It doesn't right. have independent front suspension. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what was Nissan's biggest year in America? Was it in the 70s or is it fairly recently? Well, our biggest years have been the last four or five years in a row. We're, we're doing very well overall as a brand. So yeah. 1.3, 1 1.4 million cars. Wow. Prior year, you know, so. Um, but in those early days, sales slowly built up until uh, we got to the first Arab oil embargo crisis, right. and then sales went through the roof. Right, sure. everybody. Then that was everybody who had a small, efficient car. Right, right, Sales went up. You got all 48 horsepower working. Well, it shifts like very quickly. I like nicely connected linkage. You know, you get that mechanical click. Yeah. People like to look at a car. Yeah. You know, I know they when the restaurant you sell the sizzle, not the steak. But in the car world, you got to see what the steak looks like. That's it. You know. It's been about uh, 20 years now with the Alliance with Renault. Right. And uh, and, and in the past 12 months, we just took controlling interest of Mitsubishi. So now. Oh, okay. Have, and then. And, oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah, so we have a lot of tools in the toolbox now to yeah. pull components from, but yes, many of the... Now, will Mitsubishi still be sold as that brand, or will it just... Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Do they send you over to Japan for marketing and training and stuff? Have you done that? No, it's, you know, the North American operations are the, the largest functioning unit of the company globally. Oh, okay. So. Um, you know, we're fairly autonomous in our marketing decisions. Yeah. Speaking of autonomous, do you, are, there, are there many autonomous... Uh, I haven't seen any autonomous Nissan product yet. Is there anything out there? Yeah, you know, there, there's a, a large engineering push in the company right yeah. now to develop autonomous. I think the, the goal is to have something on the road in uh, 2025. Something on the road with nobody in it. Uh, that's a <laughs> scary thought to me, uh -huh. but... <laughs> Well, I get it. You know, people say say they don't like it. I go, you know, it's progress. I mean, every aircraft is autonomous, so. Well, Dave, thanks for letting me take this out in the rain. You know, a lot of heritage collections won't let you take your stuff out when it's pouring rain. No, at Nissan, we're happy to do that with our heritage collection. The goal isn't to make perfect uh, trailer queens. The goal is to have nicely running, presenting cars that people can use. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Mm-hmm. <laughs>